Hello and welcome to the Literary Bar, the place where authors and readers come together for the book. I'm always excited to spend time with you right here in the bar. Now, a lot of you are still buzzed from our last episode on inclusion. Thank you for your kind comments. The girls will be back later and the boys will join them too. So how was your weekend? I'll tell you how I spent mine. I saw the play going at Newson Center over the weekend and I truly, truly enjoyed the excellent interpretation by the cast. The delivery and performance was captivating. So well done to the cast and production team of Go On. So go grab your cup of tea or that glass of wine and join me after the break. So our book choice for this episode is a yet to be published memoir. So it is a privilege to share this book with you because the author has gone through a deep and debilitating traumatic experience. In Nigeria and elsewhere, new mothers are expected to be happy and excited. After all, during the wedding, family and friends mark nine months on the calendar after the union for the naming ceremony. When conception is delayed, anxiety sets in from doctors to pastors, alphas and babalaos, we look for solutions everywhere. However, when the baby arrives, we expect the new parents, especially the mother, to be overwhelmed with joy. But when she's moody, irritable, angry, detached and even suicidal, everybody gets confused and suspicious of her. Because this lack of anticipated joyfulness and detachment from the baby is deemed anomalous. In Nigeria, it might even be construed as a spiritual attack. Perhaps the mother is a witch or possessed by evil spirits. For a long time, this maternal disconnect did not have words to adequately describe what the woman was going through until we learned about postpartum depression or PPD. In Nigeria, it is believed that we have over 1.5 million cases of new mothers dealing with PPD. This is not a medical program. I'm not a doctor, neither is my guest. Rather, it is the author's personal account of her journey from the depths of despair to recovery and redemption. After the break, you will meet this maternal mental health advocate and my very charming guest, Chima Ijimofo. Welcome back. There's so much to learn from this segment. So without further ado, let me introduce Chima. She's an entrepreneur, a teacher, author, and a life coach. Her professional, her professional experience includes banking, insurance, sales, and marketing. She's currently the MD of Infinite Health and Wellness Consult. Chima loves to exercise, and that's where we met during, during our exercises. She's married to Ike, and they have three wonderful children. So Chima, welcome. Thank you. To the literary bar. How are you? Very well, thank you. You look very well. Thank you. Considering what we are talking about. Oh yes, that was donkey years ago. Yes, but the scars remain. Mm, okay. They, they do or they do not? They don't. They don't remain. And we have a lot to thank for that. Family, friends, and your spiritual connection to God. Yes. Yes. But before we get to the recovery, and I'm very happy that the scars do not remain so that you can give people hope. Mm. Like I said, 1.5 million new mothers have to cope with postpartum depression. And some recover like you and some do not. Yes. It, it can actually get really tragic. Yes. So what happened to you, Chima? Okay. Um, thank you for the opportunity to share. I was one of those, um, I got married at 26. And just like you said, um, people began to count. So, but um, deep down inside us, we were prepared not to have a child in the first year anyway. However, by the third year, 
my father said to me that Jim, what's going on? And I said, how? And he said, um, are you guys not interested in <laughs> having children? Three long years. Yes. And so I said, well, we are doing everything we should do, mm -hmm. but nothing has happened. And so that's uh, how come I even knew that there is a time frame within which yeah, you're months. expected. <laughs> And so we did some medical checks mm -hmm. and that I discovered that um, I had fibroids and um, that was what was delaying conception. I went ahead to have the procedure done and we were told that six months afterwards we could begin to try. Now that six months became three years. Another it, three years? Yes, another that, three. So this is six years now? Six years now. Wow. And then, in between then, a whole lot of stuff happened, um, apart from medical um, taking um, co conception pills and all of mm -hmm. that, I do know that I built up my faith. Yeah. And when it did happen, it just happened. I couldn't mm -hmm. have said there was any special prayer or anything extra that I did I could give as a formula. Mm -hmm. But it happened. My nine months pregnancy sincerely was a breeze. Why? Because I was so prepared. Mm -hmm. I had done all the studying, uh, mm -hmm. what to expect and yes. all of that, yes. what to eat. Mm -hmm. And anyway, so because of the history of fibroid, mm -hmm. On the 39th week, yes. the doctor said to me that, I hope you know that you're going to deliver today. I just went for that, my normal um, antenatal. antenatal. I had packed like three months ago, so it was <laughs> like, oh, okay. So all I did was put a, a call across. Then we didn't have mobile phones. Mm -hmm. We had the table phones. Yeah. So I put a call across and said to my husband, please bring my stuff over. They say I will not be going today. Set me up. I didn't know I was being induced. Mm -hmm. But literally less than a few minutes after being put on that drip, mm -hmm. I told the um, midwife that I think I'm ready to go. I was fully dilated. They didn't believe me because I was a first timer. So it was when I, by myself, got off the bed, my waters broke. And that's when they realized that, ah, true, she knows what she's saying. Uh -huh. So got into the delivery room. Before I knew what was going on, some very enthusiastic lady came and used a, a razor blade to give me a, a cut, according to her, my first time, so they need to help me. But did, did they tell you to expect this? No. Okay. So, one, two pushes, the baby came out. And then, I wouldn't stop bleeding. I bled until I literally saw my spirit leaving my... It was like wow. looking at yourself. Out of body experience. Yes. And so, I said to God, excuse me, am I dying? <laughs> the way you're saying it, it sounds funny, but I know that at that point, yes. there was nothing funny about it. It wasn't funny. But you see, because I had stepped out from just being a churchgoer, mm -hmm. I know when I became a Christian. Mm -hmm. And one of the habits I had was memorizing scripture. Mm -hmm. So I knew certain scriptures. Yeah. And I said to God, excuse me, this is inconsistent. Mm -hmm. The Bible says God is not a man mm -hmm. that he should lie. Yeah. Neither is he the son of man that he should repent. Mm -hmm. Has he said it? Yeah. Will he not do it? Mm -hmm. Has he spoken it? Mm -hmm. Will he not bring it to pass? Mm -hmm. So I said, excuse me, explain this. Mm -hmm. You start a thing, then the devil truncates it. Mm -hmm. Where is your glory there? Mm -hmm. I didn't understand that I was arguing my case. Yeah. I just thought, and these were thoughts, so. Mm -hmm. I heard him say clearly, you won't die. Okay. And then I said, for me to know 
that you have truly answered me. Mm -hmm. One, my veins had collapsed. I knew when they were panicking. Oh, wow. I said, one, make this bleeding stop. Two, bring back, bring me back. Let the them get the yeah. pulse. Mm -hmm. And then help me. Yes. And almost as I thought it, I came back into myself. Okay. And I was, um, I've cut out a whole lot of, because yes. it's a long story. Yeah. So anyway, I was uh, taken back to the now um, labor, uh, what do you call, maternity ward. Mm -hmm. And um, three days later, discharged. Now, in those three days, I was not lactating. Okay. I was having rigor fever. Wow. And my breasts were as hard as stone. Okay. Because, because you were not were lactating. I wasn't lactating. Mm -hmm. Now, you'd be amazed that why would that happen in any hospital? Yes. Well, it did happen to me. Okay. A friend who's a, a medical doctor, her name is Ochi, mm -hmm. Dr. Ochi, Ibe. She came and she said, ah, Chima. Then she showed us how to use hot towels mm -hmm. and manually express mm -hmm. the breast milk. And, and, and how was your baby at this time? My baby was literally being fed with, um, um, what do you call it? Um, first and foremost, she was being given like, um, is it glucose water? I don't okay, know. Yes, yes. Just to keep yeah. her, you know. Hydrating and then when I began to be able to express, uh, manually expressed mm -hmm. she was being fed with a spoon okay and um, three days later we were discharged okay when I got home my sister-in-law looked at my tummy uh, this is uh, like sixth day seventh day mm -hmm. Said, ah, this tummy is looking untidy. Now showed my husband how to use the, the African way, the African girdle, yeah. the wrapper to tie, mm -hmm. and said I shouldn't mind the discomfort, mm -hmm. but uh, if it became unbearable, then so I, I put that on just that first night. I woke up feeling like going to ease myself, mm -hmm. and all I can remember was my name being called from far. Mm -hmm. So apparently I had passed out. Wow. In the in the in the in the bathroom. Yes, in the bathroom in a pool of blood. Oh wow. So thank God for that the girdle. Girdle. If not, nobody would have known what was going on in there. Now these were the days when street gates, securities, you know, they ran to the gate. The <laughs> gate people had locked Baba the gate. Had locked the, the and gone disappeared away. with mm -hmm. the key. My husband prayed from 1 a.m. till 5 a.m. when those people finally returned. Wow. returned. I was rushed to a different hospital, and that's where they discovered that retained placenta. Wow. So I had to have an evacuation done, and um, it's just the mercy of God, because up to now, I still can't understand Mm -hmm. explain it okay and then from the hospital naming ceremony on the eighth day yeah. that was a tradition then mm -hmm. in our local church winners well all this was happening within a week of you being a mom yes just one week yes quite an adventure yes you know the usual thing my mom she moved in mm -hmm. my mogul yes, yes. Mm -hmm. and she was a fantastic help mm -hmm. she knew everything to do I was just coasting yeah. Before all of this happened. Okay. And then my, after the naming ceremony. After the naming ceremony, I just asked if I could be allowed to stay at home mm -hmm. before going back to the hospital. Okay. Because I was on antibiotics and I couldn't breastfeed and a whole lot of stuff. I just realized that at first day I couldn't sleep. The next day I couldn't sleep and then all of a sudden I seemed to be having a lot of revelations in quotes and I was talking. Are you aware of what you were saying? 
Yeah, it was aware of some things. It was almost as if I had supernatural insight okay. into everybody's problems. Wow. And I was seeing a whole lot of stuff, a lot of things that, looking back now, it was like files that had been buried somewhere mm. were just coming out. Did you think about your baby at any point in all of this? As you were now um, no. talking. The baby was not even in my radar at all. Right. Because it was like I was in a different plane. Let mm -hmm. me put it that way. Yeah. So they just realized that rather than resting, mm -hmm. I was high, very high, you know. And I was just talking, talking, talking until they realized that, no, something is wrong. So that's how come I was taken back to the hospital. And that was the beginning of the drama. Now, another thing I found out was that the nurses would want to give me injections mm -hmm. and medications, mm -hmm. but they wouldn't answer my questions. What are you giving me? Okay. Why? It's like, hey, when doctor comes, doctor will tell you. And then doctor too had this, as if you shouldn't ask any questions. Yeah, who are you to question me, my medical so, background, yes. The whole thing was yes. so frustrating. At some point, I didn't trust anybody anymore. As a teenager, I did karate. Okay. When they want to inject me without telling me why, you will need five people to hold me down. By the end of the second day, I was all bruises because they would forcibly hold me down. They didn't care, just jab her, give her the injections. Mm -hmm. My parents lived in satellite town. We lived at Yanokmaja. Thankfully, it took maybe like two, three days before my father could visit. And when he saw me, he was like... Oh. Where were you at this time? In the hospital. Oh, just a regular hospital? Yes. Nothing. But it, and your husband, yeah. were you aware of him? Yes. Okay. He was very much around. Okay. And um, I now said to my dad that these people want to kill me. Mm -hmm. And he said, why? And then I told him, he said, oh my God. So he had to have a talk with the doctor. Mm -hmm. He said, this one, if you want to give her anything, explain it. Okay. Tell her why you want to give her this particular drug, if not. And so they had to come down and reason with me. Mm -hmm and realize that, oh yes, there are some people who want to ask questions and you must answer. Okay. So that was one phase. At some point, because my dad was a pharmacist, he had to sit down with the doctor. They found out that they were just maintaining me. There was not really any real improvement. It, it, is it possible that they did not understand what was wrong with you, this hospital where you were? It's possible. Yes. But then my father, like I said, was a pharmacist. So apart from the medical side, he also knew a bit about mental health. Yes. So that was the point at which he invited um, the late Professor Famuiwa, who was head of psychiatry mm -hmm. in Luth. Mm -hmm. That was the game changer. Okay. How many, were you aware how many weeks or months into having this baby that, you know, you had to transition from being a red, um, just a mother who's mm -hmm. not feeling so well to a psychiatric patient now? All of this was within the first two weeks. Wow. Yes, because I had the privilege of mm -hmm. having a father who knew, who had some medical background. Okay. So I think he knew what was going on. So that was why he invited the psychiatrist who came in. Mm -hmm. Before the psychiatrist was invited, I went through some things that, in fact, first they thought it was a spiritual problem. Okay. Uh, so at some mm -hmm. point, I was taken to some pastor right. who was supposed to be an expert in deliverance. 
I was subjected to fasting against my will. Mm -hmm. And at some point, I was chained down. Wow. Uh, I, you know. And the flogging. The flogging, I would not say was under the pastor's instruction. Okay. But rather the assistants mm -hmm. who were kind of amused with who is this person that they're giving all this attention. Mm. So it was like, maybe if we flog her, she has a sense will correct that kind of attitude. So you, you know, it's amazing that till tomorrow, mm -hmm. there are places where they feel that um, people who have um, some mental sort of health yes, issues. mental health issues, you know, if you're not mad, it's a spiritual attack and then they need to flog the devil. Yes. Also, you need to starve the demons out of your body. Yes, all of that. I would tell you that, yes, it happens because it happened to me. Wow. And um, in my life, nobody has ever flogged me with koboko before. <laughs> in my life. Until church. Until it happened. Mm -hmm. And so I cried out. And that was when my parents requested that my husband allow them to help him. Okay. Because all of this while he was trying to, his best to manage the situation. And that shows, you know, how important it is to have a supportive Strong spouse. support base. Yes. Siblings, friends, family. Yeah. Absolutely important. And again, where was the baby? Momsy. Momsy okay. was taken care of. Okay. Mo my mom, my sister-in-law, they were still all very much... Mm -hmm. in the picture mm -hmm. so how long did this episode last three years three years so for three years were you getting this treatment from the house or you had to be institutionalized okay what happened was that my folks were still alive so okay. they lived in satellite town and so they appealed to my husband to allow them mm -hmm. to help okay so I was with them at home. And um, I would from there attend clinics. And um, my husband was shuttling satellite town, Yanokbaji, yeah, as if it was a stroll in the park, but it wasn't easy. So that's when, you know, from there I would go for clinics. Mm -hmm. And then one day, I still recall that my father said to me that I had a pet name, Chimiwo. Mm -hmm. He said, Chimiwo, would you like to be a prayer mm -hmm. point all your life? Yes. Or would you take what you know mm -hmm. is your right as a believer? Mm -hmm. And for the first time, I sat down and I asked myself, did I have strong enough reason mm -hmm. to want to have my life back? Yes. Because at some point, it was interesting mm -hmm. for other people to mm -hmm. be taking care of you. Yes. But I thank God for tough love. Mm -hmm. Tough love tells you the truth. Tough love s says to you that, Auntie, is your life. Mm -hmm. And you have to take the driver's seat back. Yeah. So yeah, it, it was nice, everybody looking after you, but even family at a while, after a while they get tired. Yes. I didn't ever want that. My father didn't want, want that, that to for happen. You. So what was happening to the baby in this, in this three years? When did you ever realize you become a mom? And then when did you bond with your baby? At what point did, the, did all of this for the first turn. one year, mm -hmm. I can't say I was present. Okay. Other people were helping me. Mm -hmm. The way we, the family is structured, um, we've always had relatives. Okay. So I have a, an auntie mm -hmm. who is almost like a sister because yeah. we are so close in age, who moved in. Mm -hmm. And after my mom spent um, the one month um, yeah. of Mogwa, she, she stayed 
Okay. And so I had... And she became a surrogate mom. Yes, to I had to the people always around me. Mm -hmm. uh, my, my, father, my husband's family, very supportive. My family also, very supportive. So I had people who were always around. I still recall that when my mom had to leave after one month, mm -hmm. I, I broke down and I was asking her, how am I going to cope on my own? I said, don't worry, you will cope, you will cope. So at what point did you go back to bonding with your child? Well, mm, did motherhood now become something you, you were looking forward to? I would say that, um, like I said, all of this within three years. Yes. But of course, in between then, um, at some point, yes, they had to begin to step back mm -hmm. and allow me to do a whole lot more until it was, okay, you can now go back home. Because I lived in Satellite Town for almost the first one year of my daughter's life. And then went back home and began to take care of her, almost on clockwork. Yeah. But um, being bonding with her... It was gradual. It was gra at first. I was afraid of being left with her, mm -hmm. but I gradually regained. Why, why were you afraid? Because I, I didn't know. I didn't believe I could. I saw a whole lot of um, inadequacies, mm -hmm. but um, yeah. I mean, I had to agree with myself. You know, you know, what you say is very interesting because you had support from everyone. Yes. Now, there's so many people who don't even have that sort of support. Mm -hmm. Once we cross the part of it being a spiritual problem, mm -hmm. everybody hands off to holy water and deliverance methods, different, you know, flogging, fasting, and just even abandonment. You yes. Know. But and did anyone ever have something negative to say about your situation? even if everybody had only good things? Well, um, maybe not to my face. Okay. I do know that my husband had to also um, come to grasp with the situation mm -hmm. because anytime I felt inadequate or expressed mm -hmm. it, he would always tell me that I shouldn't worry, that he's here and that um, together we'll get mm -hmm who oh, got past this. Hmm. And so he was a very, very strong support base. Now, Wonderful. when I went for clinics, because I was going for yeah. checkups, you yes. know, I was seeing props of family you were almost every other week. And then as I began to get better, the, you know, clinic times began to get wider and wider. Mm -hmm. And then when my father told me that, he said to me that he's going to discuss it with the psychiatrist. Okay, your medication. My medication. Yeah. Because you see, when you're on mental health medication, there's something always a bit off about you. Mm -hmm. It's either you're extremely happy <laughs> or you're mm -hmm. down in the dumps, that kind of thing. Yeah. And I noticed that mental health yes. is expensive. Okay. We went from being comfortable financially wow. to less than zero. Because of the drugs, the medication. Because of the cost of the drugs. Of the treatment. Are there alternative treatments beyond medication that are acceptable for people living with some spectrum of mental health? Yes, so that's where my father came in. Okay. And said to me, Chi. You have to become, you have to agree with yourself yeah. that enough is enough. Yeah. Say that the healing comes from within. Yes. Because yes. that's the only real healing. Yes. Every other thing is external. That's the one that is sustainable. That's the one, one that comes from, yes. from inside of you. So I had to sit down and agree with myself hmm. that ah, I deserve to be okay. You know, I, I must uh, mention at this point that in Nigeria, when people have, are living with some sort of mental health situation, you get all the labels, colo mental, yaba left, arrow, 
and all of that. How do you think having that stigma following mental health patients around, how does that play into their treatment or even the ability for the society? You had your own personal society, you know, your father, your siblings, your husband, your friends. Yeah. They, they came around, they rallied around you and they supported you. Hmm. Now, where people are pointing at someone, say, Kolo Mental, Aru, Yaba left. It's even a joke now when somebody say, I know well, ah, me, I decrease, you know. Mm -hmm. It's become a joke of something that is really, really serious. Okay. So how do you think that we can actually give mental health the right sort of support in the midst of the stigma that is attached to this uh, condition or, or situation? Okay, I think that's where education and where awareness mm -hmm. is so important. Yeah. One of the things that the psychiatrist said to me, mm -hmm. because at some point, I guess stop taking the drugs. Okay. Now, maybe that is not. Please don't stop any medication except your doctor. No, says I was just. So. I was yes, going to uh -huh. say that. So, and I was going to say that medically, mm -hmm. that's not acceptable. Yes. However. Mm -hmm. I said to you that I had a discussion with your dad, with my dad. Mm -hmm. I had a discussion with the psychiatrist, okay, and then with my father. Mm -hmm. We just began to taper off, taper gently. off gently. And I still recall the last time I ever took any drugs. Okay, okay. that day. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You know what, if I tell you the amount of information mm. that hits the mind all wow. at the same time. Wow. Now, those drugs were helping to, as it were, calm down the situation. Okay. But when I went off the drugs that first night, it was hell. I was like, my mind was erase, erasing. That's when I understood how calm, how powerful the mind really is. Mm -hmm. Because if all the information hitting you, you were to be aware of it, you literally, you, your, your mind will pop. Yeah. So without that filter, this was happening. And that's where I now discovered another reality, which the psychiatrist said to me, that everyone he knows who has ever been able to transition themselves mm -hmm. out of medication needed an anchor okay which is like a spiritual base okay so for me he knew i was a christian mm -hmm. and he knew that my being a christian was not casual like i said to you i internalized the word of god mm -hmm. so the first night i was taken off medication and all of that was happening i couldn't sleep a pastor friend who yeah. lived in the next close came to visit. Yeah. And he just shared with me casually, Genesis, how everything was chaotic. And when he left, I just had this strong impression to start reciting okay, the word that word. very scripture. So I started. Okay. I know that... Um as we round up, I mean, this story is so captivating. And I know that um, there's, we can't wait for this book mm. to hit the shelf because people need to know more. You have survived this. Yes. And there are women today who feel that they are coming to the end of their lives without it. I know, again, because I mentioned that we met um, during exercises. I know that exercise is also very, very important very to you. Important, yeah. And another thing is that... Um, we have to guard our health. We have mm -hmm. to guard our mental health space. We need to put up guardrails so that we do not fall victims to something that our, our spirit or our body does not agree with. Yeah. You know, quickly tell, tell us something that happened when you received a particular um, text message or video Good. without anybody warning you please this is so important please okay so um that phase ended. yes i began to recover mm -hmm. i went back to school 
finally I faced doing my masters. Mm -hmm. All I wanted to do was to prove to myself mm -hmm. that mentally I was back in control. Yes. Exercise mm -hmm. became one of my strategies mm -hmm. for being able to, as it were, go through a program, achieve it. Mm -hmm. And then in the days of Blackberry, I was just given a Blackberry as a gift. And someone sent a video and with no warning of anything, innocently, I opened the video. It was the video of the lynching of those four, the Alu, Alu four, yeah. the Alu four boys, and oh gosh, that terrible. violence triggered. Yeah. So for mental health people, you, I mean, for people, you have to know what are the things that stress you out. Mm -hmm. What are the triggers? Mm -hmm. For me, violence of any form, injustice mm -hmm. of any form, triggers me. So I have to be particular. In mm -hmm. fact, there are people who, they have a, a habit of forwarding stuff. Stuff. Yeah. I don't want certain people. Yeah. If you ever send me this kind of thing again. Block and delete. Yes. Yes. <laughs> and Lock then and in groups it. I belong to, mm -hmm. you see people, maybe they caught a thief or mm -hmm. something. Yeah. Or you, there was this one of a... A, a, a soldier who was flogging a woman mm -hmm. because she said she was pregnant for him or something. Those kind of things, they so, hit me the wrong way. So we just have to yes. be vigilant. Like I said, this conversation will go on and on and on. But thankfully, Chima's memoir will soon hit the shelves and then you can get a copy. We're going to announce that when that comes up. But I... I didn't want us to wait for it to be hot off the shelf, uh, hot off the press. I said, let's get it hot, hot. Chima, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for giving people hope. Oh, yes. Thank you for sharing your story because I know it is deeply personal. And um, I can't thank, thank you enough. And we can't wait to launch the book right here at the Literary Bar. Wow. So please, when we come back we will round up the show but while we're talking some special guests walked in some beautiful beautiful girls that are my nieces so i can't wait to show them off to you so after the break do join us hello everyone my name is olivia latinde and I'm Enya Latunde, and we're here to read you a poem written by our big sister, Wuralua Latunde, titled, Head Held High. Stand up, dust it off, breathe in, breathe out. It's not you, only them. Don't take to heart the words they spit out. Those vicious snakes constricting you, suffocating your voice. Don't be ashamed, just be who you truly are. Embrace your inner warrior. That being said, violence is never the answer unless you want to be just like them. So, so stand up, dust it off, breathe in, breathe out, and try again. Welcome back. So as we round up the program, I will be remiss in my responsibility if I do not lend my voice to the plight of Dr. Ganiat Wokwola, who was kidnapped last December. We as Nigerians are pleading on her behalf. But how did we get here? That medical personnel, our guardrails against sickness and diseases are under siege. I pray that there will be a happy ending to this unpass. Thank you so much for staying with me. I want to express my profound gratitude to Chima for sharing her journey to recovery with us. Until I come your way next time, same station, Remember that the literary bar is always open. For more, please follow us on Facebook, X, and Instagram, and do subscribe to our YouTube channel at Plus TV Africa. You can watch us on DSTV channel 408 and YouTube. Make your life a great story. My name is Chinitu. Thank you very much. <laughs>